Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. Here's what we're doing. We're back in Matthew. Quick reminder, quick recap. Here's what we're doing in Matthew. We are looking in the Sermon on the Mount at Jesus' call to a higher righteousness. You see, Jesus, when he, when he comes into our life by his Holy Spirit, when he changes us, when he claims us, when he makes us new, he's not just concerned with what our hands do. He's not just concerned with what our mouth says. He's concerned with our hearts. He's concerned with our desires. He's concerned with our interior life. And today, as Jesus continues to preach the Sermon on the Mount, we see how he deeply cares about our sexuality. So yes, we are going to talk about lust. We are going to talk about sexuality, sexuality today. And because for some of us, this might be uncomfortable, welcome to Grace, if this is your first time with us, by the way. Good to see you. Glad you're here today, right? I want to start here. I want to start here. God cares about human sexuality. God cares about your sexuality. He cares very deeply about your sexuality. After all, didn't he make it? Didn't he create it? Those cells, those body parts, those drives, those instincts, and yes, even the emotions of thrill, wonder, awe, tension, and can I say arousal. We need to see that God put that in us. If we don't, we will know a false shame and guilt that we should not know. He made it. He blessed it. He made it good. We're going to see that. But that also means something else. If he made it, then here's a mind bender. If he made it, then our sexuality serves his kingdom. Yes, there is a kingdom purpose to our drives, our body parts, and our desires. We've got to claim that. We've got to stand in that space. We've got to see that. Moreover, as we look at human sexuality from a God's eye view, we need to remember something about our God. How many of you have heard the phrase omnipresent? What does that mean? He's present everywhere. When we express our sexual side, he is not absent. He does not leave the room. He does not look away. He does not blush. When we see that, two things happen in our lives. The first is this. The first is this. He gives us such a sense of gratitude and freedom that he would give us this gift, and that makes us want to pursue it rightly. That's number one. The second thing that happens when we see the doctrine of sex from his perspective is this. It gives us a sense of horror. It makes us shudder at the thought of misusing what he designed and gave to us. God cares about this deeply. And when we see that, it serves as a liberating wake-up call in our lives but into the lives of the culture out there as well. Let's go to our text, Matthew 27. This is God's holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word. Matthew 5, picking it up in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. We've got lust. We've got hell. We're doing it today, right? This is the word of the Lord. And even this is given to us in love and for our good. Amen, Grace? Here's how we're going to get at this this morning. Here's your outline. All right, also, if you did not get one, we do have a sermon guide that will probably be helpful, and it's also designed for you to take home and talk with your spouse. We've got another article you can use to talk to your children about these topics, so we've done our best to try to equip you this morning. That said, here's where we're going. First, we're going to see the strong warning. We're going to see how seriously God takes lust. But it's not enough 
to just see how seriously he takes lust. We need more than a strong warning. We need the solid reasons why. Our God has a why behind everything that he does, and we need those reasons. When you put those two together, the warning and the why, it makes us want to fight. It makes us want to follow. It makes us want to police our interior life as well as our exterior life. Once we do that, though, there's a concern. There's a concern. If we only talk about human sexuality in a prohibitive, negative, don't do this kind of a way, we're going to miss the higher righteousness. You see, higher righteousness is not just avoiding sin. Higher righteousness is running after good. So we need the good design. The good design. And don't worry, it's PG-13 rated, okay? After that, though. After that, though. As we see, okay, I want to fight because of this strong warning, these reasons why. I want to engage with the good when we see the good design. That leaves some questions. We need some guiding principles. So that's where we're going. The strong warning, the solid reasons, the good design, and the guiding principles. Let's hop into our text. Let's go to that first one. Let's see that God takes lust so seriously. Let's see the strong warning. Go with me to verse 27. Look at verse 27. Jesus is recapping one of the Ten Commandments, the Seventh Commandment. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But watch what Jesus does in verse 28. Watch where he takes it. He goes deeper. He goes broader. Right? He gets at the interior life when he says, if you look, key phrase, with lustful intent, put an underline on intent there. It's very important. You may as well have done the deed. You may as well have done the deed. God judges lust as a violation of the command against adultery. God treats it as if we have done it. The text is clear. God takes lust so seriously. I want to show you another part of the Bible where we see just how seriously God takes lust. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Do you see? It should be in bold there for you. It should say flee. Do you see where Paul tells the Corinthian church, a very sexually jacked up church, flee from sexual immorality? Why is this important? How does this help us to see how seriously God takes lust? It helps us to see it because this is the only sin I can find in the Bible where we are told to run. So often in the scriptures, what are we told? Stand, fight, guard, protect, be on watch, be on the lookout, stand firm. Here we are told, flee like Joseph running away from Potiphar's wife. Our God takes it that seriously. Now, pause right there. Pause right there. I think, if you're like me, it's very easy to get your mind wrapped around that, to go, okay, check, I understand that intellectually and cerebrally, but isn't it hard to get our hearts wrapped around that, to understand that connection? Isn't it hard sometimes to trust that and accept that our God really does take it that seriously? How do we get to that place? How do we get there where it's not just head knowledge, but heart knowledge? Here's, here's something that helped me this week, how the Lord opened my eyes, and I think it will help you really get your heart wrapped around this truth that God takes lust so seriously. Go with me to the last of the Ten Commandments. Go with me to Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. Let's look at the very last commandment. Let's look at what Jesus did not say, right? Look at the last commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, and you shall not covet What? neighbor's wife. It's right there. It's obvious. It's on the surface. It's an underhanded softball with the bases loaded. Why didn't Jesus appeal to this commandment? Why didn't he say, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has coveted? Why didn't he say that? Why does he pick the adultery option? I can only formulate why I think that is, and I'm going to share with you. You don't have to agree with me, but here's my take on that. He goes with adultery in part because adultery is the worst form of betrayal that we can experience. You know, on Friday, I was talking to a couple that I hadn't seen in a while. Uh, they're at Smith's funeral home. And, and, and I learned that they had, at some point in their life, experienced a very serious family betrayal. You know what they said that I think really applies? They said this, yes, it hurts when someone stabs you in the back. 
It hurts when you find that there is a blade in your back, but you know what hurts worse than the blade sticking in your back? It's when you turn around and you see the hand on the handle and you see who it is that's betrayed you. That's the worst part. That's the pain. That's what hurts. Apply that to adultery, all right? When it's your spouse, when it's your companion, your partner, your teammate that is standing there with a knife in your back, that just does something viscerally to you. It's hard to think of a worse pain than that. This is the way our Father in heaven sees a wayward glance, stray fantasies, and things like that. He says you're holding a knife in your spouse's back. That helps our hearts grasp just how seriously God takes lust. That helps us to want to police it. But here's the thing. It's not just that we don't want to be the ones holding the knife. There's actually a silver lining. There's good news when you think about the fact that God takes it so seriously. If God takes lust so seriously, then guess what? He is on your side when you fight it. He is on your side when you obey him and you flee. He wants you to know victory in this area of your life because he takes it that seriously. He wants this part of your life to flourish because he takes it so seriously. He wants you to live out the higher righteousness of his kingdom's sexual ethic. He is a good father. He doesn't just give you a standard. He helps you get to that standard. He's for you. Do you see that? Oh, there's some beautiful news in knowing, in knowing that he takes it seriously. But we have to do more than that. We have to do more than just see that he takes it seriously. We need some more help. Let's go to our next point. Let's go to point number two. Let's see why he takes it so seriously. Let's look at the solid reasons, the solid reasons. You know, it really helps us to know why God takes lust so seriously. I mean, if you're here and you're not a Christian, if you're not sure about Jesus, this may sound really severe. It may sound restrictive. It may sound oppressive. It may reinforce your preconception that Christians are tidy whitey prudes, that God is a killjoy, and Jesus is out to rob you of fun and joy. We're going to see that that's not the case. We're going to get there. But let's explore several reasons why. Let's look at our Father's wisdom. Let's look at Jesus' wisdom. Here's the first reason why. First and foremost, lust clearly destroys families. Lust clearly destroys families. If you engage with online pornography, statistically speaking, you are three times more likely to have an affair. Three times more likely to have an affair. That destroys a family. Over half of all divorces involve one partner who is obsessively compelled to look at pornography. The bottom line here is that lust has a unique power to tear families apart. Our Father in heaven knows what he is doing when he takes lust and links it with adultery. He's not prohibitive. He's wise. He's wise. That's the first reason. It destroys families. What's the second reason? The second reason is this. Lust drives a modern-day industry that destroys other people's lives. We've got to look at sermons as not just fundamentally for us, for me and my application. In sermons, we need to see how we're called to treat other people. We need to think about other people. We need to apply truths to a community and to the world around us. So let's do that. Let's do that. You know, there are people out there, and this was me in college, who would have said, it's harmless. It's a little fun. What's the big deal? Why does this matter? I'm not even married. I can't destroy a family, right? You would push back, and I would hear you. I've used that. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. People who say this have no clue how many women are coerced into becoming online actresses? We have no clue how many women are coerced against their consent. There are many, many stories out there of ladies who think they are going somewhere for a sleep study 
or who think they are getting finally a fitness modeling opportunity or, or, or maybe a fashion modeling opportunity, and the next thing they know, they are drugged up, they are chock full of alcohol, and they are being coerced to sign contracts that they're not even allowed to read. This is documented. This is documented. It should make our blood boil. And then after they are drugged up, after they sign these contracts, you can imagine what happens next. Oh, Grace, if you look at online stuff, if you look at the print stuff, that smile may not be a smile. What you're looking at may be non-consensual. It may be a form of trafficking. You will never know the true story behind what we're watching for just a little harmless fun. It impacts and destroys other people's lives. We do not always understand the impacts of our lustful indulgences, but God does. And as a good father, as a good king, he cares about the vulnerable. He cares about the weak. He cares about those who don't have any other protection. That's who he is, and that's what he did for us in the gospel. He knows that we live in a fallen world. He designed sexuality good, but in a fallen world, our drives, our passions can be exploited for profit. And he doesn't want us to go down that road. So he gives us this warning. And he says, don't go down that road. He's wise to connect them to. That's number two. What's the third reason why? Here's the third reason why. Lust is clearly linked to escalating violence. Lust is clearly linked to escalating violence. Did you know 90% of all scenes in adult films include some form of physical intimidation or aggression? If you engage with this stuff, if you use this stuff, you get desensitized to it. You start to accept it. It starts to grow in you, and you start to expect it and think that it is acceptable. Our God does not want us going down that road. He warns us about lust so it can be nipped in the bud. Let's look at a fourth and final reason why. It's perhaps the best one. Our sexual drive can be the most powerful motivator in the human heart. I had data, I had stories, I even had a science experiment for you, but I don't think you need to be sold on that. We have all felt its pull. We know intuitively that it can master us, and we've seen this play out in other people's lives. We've felt its power. Here's the point. Here's the point. God understands that our sexual drive has. He understands its power in a way that we do not we tend to think we've got it under control, where slowly and surely it is controlling us. That right there, I hope helps you see. If it's that powerful of a motivator, I hope you see how it can very easily put you on the road to adultery or other forms of sexual immorality. There's more reasons I could cover, but I think you get the point here. There's always wisdom behind the ways of Jesus' kingdom. So Jesus is not overreacting by linking lust to adultery. He's trying to protect us, but he also wants to protect other people. This is part of living for his higher righteousness. So when we see that Jesus takes lust seriously, when we see the reasons why, we start to wake up. We start to take this as seriously as he does. We don't want the fire to burn us. We don't want it to burn other people. So we cannot hide. We cannot keep this conversation in the dark. It must be brought out into his light and seen for what it is. But good news, Grace, there's help. There's hope. We need to see that to live out this higher righteousness, to receive help and hope, it's not just about avoiding the negative. It's about pursuing the positive. So let's go to point number three, and let's look at his good design for human sexuality. Here's my concern in like assembling, preparing, praying, thinking about you, praying for you, getting wise counsel on how to handle this text. Here's my concern. To chase the deeper goodness of Jesus' kingdom, how many times have we seen in churches, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and we create these checklists of don'ts, and we forget to celebrate the good, right? 
Like we can find righteousness and holiness and godliness into people who don't do things, who don't say things. We don't always look at it as a positive. Here's what you get to do, right? Like when we do this, we miss something important. We underemphasize that sexuality is fundamentally good, and if it is good, we need to know how to use it for good. Why? Because that goodness is also a part of higher righteousness. This is so important, I want to phrase it this way. We can fall short of his higher righteousness if we misuse our sexuality in lustful ways. That is true, but we can also miss his righteousness by not using his sexuality for the good purposes that he created it for. It's kind of like when we talked about anger a couple weeks ago. We said anger can be good, and if you stuff righteous anger, you could actually be in sin because you're letting an injustice happen. Same thing with our sexuality. But if it's good, we need help. We need to know why it's good. We need to know, okay, what uses our kingdom uses? What what makes it good? What purpose does it serve? Why did God create it? Well, there's several ways. We're going to go through five. If you feel fire hose, don't worry about it. It's in your notes. Let's go through these. First, go with me to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Here we find, here we find that God created us male and female, each with our own unique and complicated and complex reproductive system. God made it. That's what it means to be male. That's what it means to be female. But he didn't just create male, female. He created male and female. Put a circle around that. That's marriage. God created marriage. And then look at verse 28. God blesses us. And how does he bless us? He doesn't do this and sprinkle holy water at us. He blesses us by saying, go, be fruitful, multiply. Like from the earliest pages of the Bible, our sexuality is there. There's the first good kingdom use of our sexuality. It's procreation, it's being fruitful, it's multiplying, that's one. What's two? Everybody knows that one. Thank you, Pastor John. All right, what's number two? What's number two? Number two is this. Go with me to Genesis chapter two, verses 24 through 25. Now I think it's gonna start hitting home a little bit deeper here. In the context of marriage, we see in Adam and Eve and their lack of shame, we see that they became one flesh. They became one flesh. Sexuality is a gift to promote one fleshness, oneness, unity. There is freedom. There is intimacy. There is relational bonding and building that happens when you engage with your spouse. In fact, I want you to think of the main verb that is used in the Bible for sex. What is it? To know. To know, right? How many times do you read in the Bible? So and so took so and so to be his wife, and he knew her, and she bore a child, knowing. It's not a euphemism, it's a beautiful word. It's getting at one fleshness, it's getting at oneness, it's getting at how to build that in a marriage. So there's the second purpose for kingdom sexuality it is to promote one fleshness in marriage. What's three? What's three? The third use is this. Go with me to Genesis chapter 24, verse 67. Genesis chapter 24, verse 67. What has just happened in the prior 66 verses? Isaac's mother has died, and his father Abraham sent out a servant to go find Isaac's wife, Rebekah. Isaac receives the blessing of his wife. She's, it's, we find earlier in that chapter, she's quite a beautiful lady. And what do they do? They unite. They unite while he's still in mourning. How do you know that? Because it's his mother's tent, not his tent. Here we see that our sexuality is a source of comfort within marriage. Grace, there are hard days. There are rough seasons. And coming together says, I am on your side. You have at least one person in this world that is getting your back as you face this ordeal. There's the third use of sexuality, comfort, comfort. What's the fourth? What's the fourth? Here we go. Proverbs 5 and Song of Solomon. No one's smiling. I've given you a handout with verses. You get to go home and read them with your spouse. 
Here is the thing. When you read parts of Proverbs 5, when you read the Song of Solomon, most of us blush. Most of us blush. I'm not even going to some depths that some pastors go. But you need to read these passages at home. These verses make clear Another kingdom use for sex is joy and delight, and we need to say that. It is for joy. It is for delight. Why? Because when you delight in each other, you are offering each other the deepest form of human acceptance. It is good. We should not feel uncomfortable. We should not feel ashamed. Who does not want their spouse saying to you, I accept you over any other human being on the planet, and I accept you into the deepest places of me? I see you. I see your foibles. I see your failures, and I still accept you at this level. Every man, I don't care who he is, wants a cheerleader. And the Bible, in very stark language, gives you permission to go do that. Oh, grace. Oh, grace. You get to enjoy a relationship in marriage that no other human being gets. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. There's your fourth kingdom use. Joy and delight that deepens the marriage bond through practicing acceptance. What's the fifth? The fifth is this. It's protection. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. We covered this a couple weeks ago. I'm not going to go very deep here. But here's Paul's point. He's clear. Healthy, regular, one fleshness protects each other from temptation. Not just physical temptation, but the temptation to emotional affairs, unhealthy attachments with other people, a voyeuristic life or a life of fantasy, it is a protection. There are five uses of human sexuality. I hope you see what a gift it is. With this understanding, there is so much good. There is so much good. We should praise God for this, right? Like in these uses of sex, do you see the higher righteousness at work, right? Like it, it, it's always giving. It's always serving. It's always building up another person. You're not selfishly taking. You're not being demeaned. You're not demeaning another. You're living like Jesus. You're living sacrificially. You're giving away. And that's how he lived. And that was a big component of his righteousness. So let's be mindful of these uses and let's not neglect them. Or we may find that we're not actually pursuing his kingdom righteousness. That's one way that it's good. Here's another way that it's good. Do you see Do you see that the biblical doctrine of sex can never be described as prudish, restrictive, repressive, oppressive, or old-fashioned? If it is, give me this version, right? Amen? All right, here you go. When you come to faith in Jesus, he will not rob you of your joy. He will not take away your fun. It's actually quite the opposite. He wants you to flourish. He wants you to have more joy. It just requires two things for this flourishing to take place. A plant needs sunlight. It needs water. Our sexuality to flourish needs two conditions. Number one, the safe and sacred bond between man and woman in marriage. And number two, it needs that we steer clear of the lust that can cheapen or corrupt this amazing design. Oh, grace, grace, when we get this, it really changes how we view human sexuality. It takes the physicality that our world craves and infuses it with spirituality. In short, the Christian view of sex is so much better than the world's view of sexuality. It's clear, it's joyful, it's serving. When we see that better, when we see what God has given us, we should shudder to think about dipping into lust. We should shudder to think about corrupting this good, amazing gift. And if our hearts are in a place where we want God's good design, let's go to our fourth and final point. Let's look at some practical guidelines. Let's look at the good guidelines that will help us. Let's start by going to verses 28 and 29. Let's go back to the text. I understand we've been away from the text for a little bit, but I think we're still being textual. In verse, excuse me, 29 and 30. In verses 29 and 30, 
There's a famous passage, right? Cut out your eye, cut off your hand. The debate is Jesus being literal. Is he not being literal? Jesus is not being literal. If he was being literal, we'd have to cut out our hearts. We'd have to cut out our tongues. We'd have to cut off our heads. We'd have to sever our brains from our bodies. No, Jesus is not being literal. But there is a point, and Jesus' point is this. His point is this. Do what it takes to protect yourself. Do what it takes to protect other people in your life. Go to extreme measures if necessary. With that in mind, let's look at some different demographics in our congregation, and let's look at how we can live this out. First, let me speak to the parents. Parents, here are some thoughts for you and for your home. Number one, be careful with smartphones. Our new families and youth pastor, Pastor Patrick, has made me smarter on this. He's pointed out rightfully, it is so easy to not know what they can stumble into. It is so easy for pop-ups or misspelled words to lead to bad places. Also, just accept that our kids are better at us in getting around parental controls. I was talking to a pastor in North Carolina this last week, and, and, and he actually told this story. He said, we finally got our daughter a phone, but then we found out the first thing she Googled was, guess what? How to get around parental controls, <laughs> right? They're better than us at it. They're smarter than us at it. If you need help in this category, please go see Pastor Patrick. Please go see Nicole. They are a wonderful resource. Here's another one for you, parents. All of us were raised that we need to give the talk. It is not the talk. It is a series of talks. It is a series of talks. You cannot get every question answered in one sitting. Moreover, our children change, their questions change, and the situations that they face change. We have to keep an open line of communication, and we have to keep an ongoing dialogue. The final thing I'm going to say to parents is this. You also need to have the conversation much earlier than you think. You need to have the conversation much earlier than you think. Apparently, about 50% of fifth grade boys have already been exposed to online pornography. Fifth grade, maybe not even a teenager yet. The onset of puberty has been dropping since the 1800s and it continues to drop. Right, like, well, like here, here's some data from a class I took, and this is 10 years old. This data is 10 years old, so it's changed. In the 1800s, the average age for the onset of puberty was 14 and a half years old. By the 1970s and 1980s, it had dropped to 13 years old. Today, as of today meaning 2010, it was 11 and a half years old. They're growing up quicker. They're beginning their journey to adulthood much sooner than we're used to. Parents, there's some help and hope for you. Come talk to us. Come let us know if you need more help. Here's the second group that I want to talk to. I want to talk to the people in our congregation that are single or that struggle with same-sex attraction. If you are here and you are single, regardless of your age, or if you experience same-sex attraction, please know that you can live a life of worth and dignity if you never get married. As I made the case for God's good design for sexuality, I was worried about y'all. I was concerned for you. I understand it can make you feel like you're missing out, like you're incomplete, that you're not experiencing all that life has to offer, you may feel cheated. And I just want to say that is simply not true. Paul was a single man when he was planting all of those churches. And guess what? Paul lived a pretty fulfilling life. He was very useful to the Lord. Moreover, Jesus was single. I don't think anyone would ever say he wasted his life. He probably knew the most fulfilling life of any human being ever. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, your singleness is an incredible gift. You have the time and the space and the, and the resources to do more for the kingdom. Please invest it well and you will not feel like your life is a waste. 
Here's the third group that I want to talk to in the room. It's the married people. It's the married people. I want to say this. Don't be shy. Talk. Talk explicitly. Talk with the freedom that the Bible gives you. I'll be honest. I'm going to get a little worked up here. I get sick and damn tired of churches trying to add a crusty cultural layer to the Bible. Where the Bible speaks, we listen, and pastors need to be able to preach the Bible. You do not need the tradition you grew up in as much as you need God's word. If God's word speaks with clarity and with frankness, that is for our good. Go home and read Proverbs 5. Go home and read Song of Solomon 2. Go home and read Song of Solomon 5 and Song of Solomon 7. And guess what? I want you to see that God inspired double entendre. He inspired innuendo. You do not have a dirty mind as you read those passages if you go, does that mean that? Yes, it means that. Grace, it is a gift. The Holy Spirit spoke these words. He inspired these words. Who are we to say, oh, no, I'm worried about the kids. But then we never teach the full counsel of God is not all Scripture inspired by God and profitable and useful for teaching and instruction. Here at Grace, we're cracking the crust of tradition. We'll keep it where it's good, but we give a rip about the Bible and its highest. It is the foremost. It has the highest authority. Do not call bad what your Father in heaven has spoken and called good. How dare you? And as you read those passages, I want you to see how unashamed that wife is of her husband's body. I want you to see how unashamed of his wife's body that man is. I want you to see what they do, and I want you to talk and talk openly without shame, without reservation, without fear. We gotta get past this prudishness. It sets a bad witness for others, and it erodes your marriage. The feelings of shame and guilt that keeps couples from living out God's good design for sex need to be buried in the ground, not in the bedroom. When you don't talk about it, when you don't experience the freedom that God's word gives you, guess what happens? You're susceptible to lust. You'll think about other men, maybe not sexually, but ooh, he's kind of nice, the way he talks to her, right? You're at risk for an emotional affair. When you repress it, when you stuff it, when you don't talk about it, men, what do we do? It erupts in our fantasy life, our thought life. It doesn't work anyways. Here at Grace, we are biblical, and I will never back down from that. So let's get in there, let's talk, talk about your life together, and check in on each other with respect to lust. Final crowd is this. Final crowd is this. This was me. This was me. Those of you who struggle with lust, you need to know that there is victory in Jesus Christ. I know from personal experience what it feels like to think that, that, that I will never be free of this. To never be free of lust, of hookup culture, or online pornography. I know what it feels like to constantly feel defeated, to feel like you're taking two steps forward, three steps back, one step forward, ten steps back. And when will deliverance ever come? But I know this, victory in the here and now really is attainable. How can I say that? Not just because he's done that in my life, but I can say it because he came to live for you. He lived a sinless life of complete sexual purity, and now in him, you are robed in that purity. God looks at you, and he no longer sees your polluted thoughts. He no longer sees what's in your past. He looks at you, and he sees the purity of Jesus Christ, your big brother. But I can also say that there's victory in the now. Why? Because he died for you. He died for you. When he went to the cross, he took on every one of our wayward desires, our wondering looks, our seductive words, and our deviant acts. And guess what he did? He put that on himself. He took that on. Can you imagine that? He took the punishment for us. He who calls us to cut out the eye, he who calls us to cut off the hand to avoid hell, he lost more than that. 
He lost his whole body. So now, by faith in him, our whole body will never know one flick of hellfire's flames. Oh, he's good and he loves you. By faith in him, you now, right now, stand clean. But there's more to this victory. I know there is victory in the now because he rose for you. When Jesus rose, he broke the power of sin. He rose victorious, and you rise with him in that victory. How do you know that? Because he put his spirit in you, the spirit that empowered his ministry, the spirit that empowered his obedience, the spirit that gave him the strength to walk in purity dwells in you. You have that same empowerment. You can walk in victory today. Finally, I can say there's victory because he's coming back for you. If you are here and you are in Christ, there will be a final victory. Sin will know a final reckoning and Jesus will crush it, zap it, and dissolve it and your struggle will be a thing of the past. You really will know a final freedom. Do you see his great love for you? We call this the gospel And we're going to call you to Jesus right now. Come to him if this is you. Come forward and get filled with his great love and his perfect life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his current reign, his giving you the spirit, and in his return. When your heart is filled with his love for you, it really will drive out any other lesser lust that poses as love. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Father God, you are a good God. Oh, Father God, you, you, you break us free. You free us from bondage. But, Father, you don't just free us from the negative. You free us to the positive. So, Father, I pray. Oh, I pray for the marriages. I pray for the singles. I pray for the same-sex attracted. Father, I pray for the parents. Father, please help us to go walk and live this truth out, but help us to walk full of your great love for us. And all God's people say, amen. Amen.